Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We're very warm. Welcome. Uh, it's lovely to see you all. Um, and welcome to the Salt Plus Earth Festival of the Landscape, the Seascape and the Environment. That matters. Um, I'm Nick Johansson. I'm director at the Kent Downs Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. Um, our job is to conserve and enhance this amazing landscape and to share our love and our joy for it. And through this festival, uh, where we're collaborating with uh, the folks in Fringe and Creative Folkestone, we're looking at those landscapes and those seascapes through twin, that's what I first wrote, or perhaps the common lenses of art and science. Um, and artists have been and scientists have been joining us throughout this time in preparation and over the weekend. Um, and I hope you've had a chance, and I have some familiar faces from previous talks, uh, uh, had a chance to see some of, the, um, some of the artwork, some of the interventions that have been created, and that will continue. There will be uh, work that lives on from this festival. The Salt Plus Earth Festival is an ex ex uh, expansion, an extension of the Salt Festival um, which is in support of our ambition to secure and create a new cross-channel UNESCO uh, global geopark, working with our, our colleagues and our friends in the similar, similar landscape in France, the Parc Naturel Régional. We're really excited to be working together to create a new international geopark connected, not separated by the channel. And just, some of you may have already seen this over the weekend, but just to illustrate that, um, that intention, we've got a short video now. Here we go. So this festival is very much uh, part of uh, that journey and, and the interventions and the artworks and the, your engagement is very much part of the journey of securing uh, that cross-channel global geopark. Now on Friday we had a great presentation from uh, Dr. Anjana Katwa, which covered only four and a half billion years. Um, and the <laughs> the to today's uh, talk, uh, covers somewhat younger uh, geology, but still hundreds of millions of years, absolutely unimaginable timescales. Um, Sanjeev, Professor Sanjeev Gupta, I should say, uh, I, this has been a wonderful journey, this geopark thing, because we're making lots of new friends, so the formality escaped me for a moment. Sanjeev has spent a lot of his research time in this area showing us how the channel and the geology of a channel connects us and how the land bridge, which once more physically connected us in a sense, was uh, finally breached. Sanjeev, you've been an absolutely brilliant and great and enthusiastic supporter of our ambition to create this cross-channel geopark. 
Um, and we're all, I think, really excited to hear from you, much less than from me. So <laughs> sorry, much more for, than from me. So Sanjeev, um, Professor Sanjeev Gupta, over to you. Thanks very much. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here and to have a conversation with you about your beautiful landscape here, which is really absolutely one of a kind on Earth and is really, really special. And what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit of a story, a, a story actually about how we came to discover how we know a little bit about what we see here. So if I can get the, oh, I guess I can move this on. No idea how this works. If we can get the first slide. Thank you. Ah, here we go. So I'm going to tell you about the channel puzzle. Um, this is rather amusing jigsaw puzzle I found at my children's school jumble sale one day. It comes from the heyday of the 70s when, as you can clearly see, the enhancement of all this technology, you know, planes, ferries, and trains under the tunnel actually enhanced the biodiversity um, quite remarkably, as you can see. Uh, I think we've learned otherwise. But really, really captures actually an age old thing, question of how we get to have this gap between Dover and Calais in the Straits of Dover. Oh, I'm having difficulty with this. Not being able to move this on. Ah, here we go. So it comes into all sorts of books here. So the crime thriller writers have already caught on to this topic of mystery in the channel and calamity in Kent. Actually, I'm actually reminded by a story here. I have a personal calamity I'm going to share with you from coming to Folkestone when I was six. I grew up in Kent and um, we come on many day trips to Folkestone and I lost my two little toy cars on the beach when the sea came in and washed them away. So if anyone's found them, please let me know. <laughs> um, but we will talk about the mystery in the channel and the calamity in Kent as we go forward. Oop, that's gone backwards. Oh, dear, oh dear, oh dear. It's the middle one. Okay, sorry. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about flood in the channel, continent cut off. I think some of you may know the famous Times headline from the 30s or 40s where there was a huge fog and it was fog in the channel, continent cut off. And this is work that I've done with my colleague Jenny Collier, who's a her geophysicist at Imperial College, um, plus together many, many colleagues in Europe. So it's actually been quite an international effort over there. It, and it's been a serendipitous journey. It's not something we intended to do. It came about um, quite by surprise and accident, and I'll tell you that a little bit later. So as you can see from this, this is a digital topographic map, a low resolution one, off the northwest uh, continental shelf. And um, we've got obviously uh, France over here, Britain, and the shallow seas, and then they extend all the way out to the, what we call the continental shelf slope break before we go into very deep water of the Atlantic over here. And these areas over here, these shallow pink areas here, would have been during sea level falls, dry land. And in fact, at the peak of the last glaciation, the shoreline would have actually extended from Cornwall out to Britain. So the shoreline would have been over here. And all of the channel would have been dry land and early humans would have been able to migrate across at the peak of those glaciations, even though it would have been very, very cold. Now, it's been long understood that clearly Britain was actually connected to the continent at the Straits, and the gap is relatively recent. And it's always been considered that that gap was produced by slow erosional processes. So just the gradual wearing away over long periods of time by the sea off those chalk cliffs. And it's just you know one of those ideas that's in the books. Nobody ever questions it because it just seems so reasonable and the correct answer. But science doesn't really work that way. Um, and I guess the big dilemma here really is, it's actually the battle between the pork pie and the croissant, if we have to go to our cultural memes, and I think the croissant has won. Um, ubiquitous across Britain, but you won't see many pork pies in France, they'd probably claim them themselves. Okay, this is a really important diagram. This just shows you 
uh, it's actually a really dramatic dra diagram. It's, it shows you um, time on the horizontal axis from around 600,000 years ago, 600,000 years ago, and on the vertical axis is, is sea level, basically, relative sea level, with zero being our present sea level at the present day. Okay? So what you can see is that sea level has dramatically fluctuated in the last 500,000 years. Actually, the discovery of this has been one of the most remarkable feats of science in, in the last 50 years um, by geochemists and geologists working from a range of theory and linked to how the, sun, uh, the Earth orbits the Sun. Um, what's remarkable is that you can see that during the peaks of the glaciations, um, when all the, sea, uh, the water and the seawater was locked up in the ice caps, sea level actually plunged to minus 140, minus 120, minus 140 meters below present day sea level. And you can see this has happened multiple times. And the high stands of sea level, that's when sea level is high, have been relatively limited. In fact, Britain has actually only been an island for very short periods of time. Maybe our politics doesn't quite capture that. <laughs> um, this is so remarkable that I actually gave a talk to, uh, I was giving, showing this in a talk to imperial physicists who work on string theory, you know, the very clever theory of how the universe came to be. And they were just amazed. And they said, how did you work this out? And I said, it's just really complicated and I'm not sure you'd understand it. Um, so uh, again, the croissant and the pork pie here. So what's really remarkable, as Nick has shown you, is that you know, we, we really, uh, the White Cliffs of Dover are obviously uh, a, a national emblem for Britain. Um, what the French don't really go on about is they have their own white cliffs. It's not such a national emblem, but they're still there. And obviously the geology has, has long been recognized for hundreds of years, continues from Dover across to Cap Blancnais, to Sangat. And this would have been a rock ridge that continued prior to the breach, and that would have been a migration pathway for early humans crossing into things. So that, 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 is, that is what we call the land bridge, if you like. And the White Cliffs obviously feature very heavily in our recent political history. Uh, I've been collecting the cartoons, and without question, the White Cliffs are the most ubiquitous uh, symbol of, uh, of Brexit. Um, so there's a variety of them that I will show you just to get this across. I love this one here. And what's beautiful about this is this actually gets the geology right. This is the only cartoon that actually gets the geology right. And this is... Uh, Theresa crossing from France to Britain or the other way around. I'm not sure whether the diagram has been flipped, um, but this would have been a continuous uh, thing. Okay, so let's move on actually to the actual science. And you know, this is the view we get when we're walking along the White Cliffs Park. Um, and it is amazing to think about what actually lies under the sea there. And this has remained inaccessible until very, very recently. And the reason we got into this was when I started at Imperial in uh, 1998, um, actually funding for my own research area was quite low, and I was talking to my colleague, Jenny Collier, who I was a friend of mine from uh, Oxford days, um, and she worked on something completely different. And uh, she said, well, there's this new equipment coming available that we could use to survey shallow sea. So she was an experienced person at surveying the deep marine oceans to look at the physics of the deep earth. Um, but this new equipment, and nobody in the UK had this equipment, so we put in a speculative bid as very junior academics back in 1999, I believe, uh, to the government to bid for this equipment. And by complete surprise, we actually got funded to the tune of about two million pounds to buy this equipment. The big problem was we actually didn't know how to use this. Um, and our plan, of course, was not to go to the cold, icy seas of Britain, but it was to go to nice tropical places like the Gulf of Corinth and, uh, you know, Baja California and the Gulf of Suez, where we could bask in the sunlight and, in, you know, on our swimming gear and occasionally uh, do some surveying. But we had to learn how to use equipment. So we started actually our surveys in the English Channel with no hope of actually finding anything. We just needed to learn how to use the equipment, basically. And uh, people heard about our plans, and we actually got funded by English Heritage, who uh, were starting a survey in the channel, funded by the Agris Levy Fund, to actually, because there was this idea, obviously, that early humans had lived 
in these now submerged areas that there were archaeological remains that could be potentially destroyed by aggregate mining. So we were funded uh, to actually do some of the first baseline mapping using our sonar equipment. Now, people have actually thought about this problem for a long time, but without that data. And I came across this beautiful uh, paper from 1701, published in the Transactions of the Royal Society. So John Wallace is actually really famous for, uh, he was the first person to use the infinity symbol in calculus. So one wonders if he, uh, he was actually, he lived in Ashford, so I wonder if he looked across this gulf of, from Britain to France and thought about the infinite separation of our two countries. Uh, but he actually talks about, I shall read from his, um, he is of the opinion he, that it is highly probable, this is 1701, that it is highly probable, if not absolutely certain, that France and England, or Gaul and Brittany, were anciently joined by an isthmus or neck of land, where now is the narrow passage between Dover and Calais. So it's just remarkable that people were already thinking about that um, um, so long ago. And he calls it the narrow sea. Um, and then subsequently, uh, geographers pondered um, um, all sorts of geographic maps without actually needing physical data. So this is a famous textbook from Jukes Brown, kind of around 1905. He was a very famous geographer, uh, which looks at the drainage patterns pre the breaching of the straits. And you can see that uh, we've got some small rivers running through the center of the channel. And then the big rivers actually run out to the Norwegian Sea, and that's mainly the Rhine and the Thames are confluent in the North Sea and drained out to the north. Then Dudley Stamp, following on an earlier work, uh, and Dudley Stamp was a very famous geographer uh, from the uh, 1940s, 1950s, um, actually first posited that there might have been a lake in the southern North Sea that had been dammed to the north by the ice sheets, the Scandinavian and British ice sheets coalescing, and the rock dam at the strait, basically, so the ridge at the Straits of Do Dover. And these were sort of, had been sort of speculated about in various literature, but again, we had no actual real data um, under the sea. And it wasn't until the 1960s when there was a huge program of joint collaboration between French and British geologists in actually, you know, really integrated study, actually mapping out uh, the form of the valleys, and a huge series of papers were produced in the 1970s. And this is a paper by, um, from a paper by Alex Smith, who's a geologist at, in the University of London, uh, where he took the, all those detailed maps and produced this compilation. And what this shows you in the channel is, in black, is a series of valleys that were carved into the rock floor of the English Channel, and this has been compiled from lots and lots of different bits of data. Unfortunately, the original data is lost. I haven't even been able to get access to that. I'll find out where it is. Um, we're much better at keeping data these days, scientific data. It wasn't so great then. So I can't actually reconstruct how this map came to be. Uh, so it's partly science and partly a little bit of artistic license here, I, I think, um, in here. But... Um, Alex Smith actually wrote this very prescient paper. He described these valley systems, and he published this paper in Marine Geology in 1985, which I accidentally came about uh, in the library, um, where he described uh, a model, again, a speculative model, and science actually works on speculations. You throw yourself out there, and you're usually torn apart, and Alex Smith did get torn apart for the speculation. But he suggested that, that this valley system was produced by the overflow of this lake in a catastrophic process. Um, and his paper was met with deafening silence because it was so speculative and uh, people just didn't believe him. You know, there was no evidence. And basically, I, it was a big leap. It was a big leap to go from, to this, from this map of these valley systems. People just argued that these are, these are normal river, river valleys carved by normal processes. And scientists don't like catastrophic processes because I think it takes them back to those flood episodes, you know, the ideas of the biblical flood, etc. And they like to obviously understand things. And where there's things they can't see, there's an idea in, in geology, as well, the principle of uniformitarianism, that processes that we see today have always acted in the past. So the past has been governed by present day pro the processes we see in the present. But because we can't see these high magnitude catastrophic events, 
scientists have great difficulty with that, and we've experienced that difficulty with our own papers. So we came across this paper whilst we were doing our surveys and thought, oh, well, okay, this is testable. We now have the equipment to be able to image this, etc. Okay, so um, funded by English Heritage, we went out completely clueless about how to <laughs> operate this gear. So we were out from Brighton in this boat over here with our very expensive 800,000 pound sonar strapped to the side of the vessel. Fortunately, one of my best friends was an actually expert in using this, so we persuaded him to come over from Alaska to help us out, and uh, had two very good uh, postdocs helping us on this. I was terrible at sea, so I'm not a marine geologist. This was completely new territory for me. I went a few times and was so seasick. It was unbelievable. I was completely useless, and I'm not very good technically either. So, um, uh, yeah, my kids just laugh at me. By the way, I have to take a picture of you all because my kids think that only two people ever come to my talks. <laughs> so I'd like to convince them otherwise. Uh, and that, that two people is me and the introducer. <laughs> so, so actually quite a funny story was that when I went to see my two postdocs, um, they seemed to be really out of it. I was a bit concerned they were on drugs because they seemed to be completely doolally, frankly. I was a bit concerned. Um, it turned out they were taking seasickness tablets. <laughs> Uh, which make you quite hazy, basically, but it's, it's really quite difficult working in the English Channel. It's quite it's the shallow waters, the waves, the climate. It's really hard work. And, but the results were just spectacular. And the beauty of doing sonar, unlike other aspects of science, where you have to process the data. We have to process the data. But you actually, when you're on the ship, on the boat, you actually see the data coming up. And this is the first bit of data we collected. Uh, and this is actually not the whole channel, but just a small part of the channel. And this is actually the, the River Arran, the offshore course of the River Arran that goes offshore. And you can see this in the bathymetric chart, and this is actually our sonar data. And you can see the valley edges over here, and you can see all this little detail here. So when we first produced these, I remember presenting them at an archaeological conference that had been organized by English Heritage, and you know, people were just amazed. I think. I don't, don't think we realized how amazing it was. This was the first true high-resolution view of the English Channel. Um, and actually, it appeared on the BBC News uh, the day after. You know, we were called in to talk about this on BBC Six O'Clock News. I hadn't quite realized how significant that was, that to, to actually see something that nobody's actually seen before. It is like seeing another planet for the first time in some ways, even though it's in our backyard. Um, so, but that data, is, let me just go back. Um, we've actually mapped with our own equipment an area of about 20 square kilometers um, in about two months at a very high resolution. This is uh, uh, two meters uh, per pixel, so two meters resolution grid. Uh, the trouble is you can't map the entire English Channel like that. Now what had happened was that the, the, the people who are responsible for mapping the bathymetry of the channel and the seas around Britain uh, are the UK Hydrographic Office, and that's for civil safety at sea. They, and they produce these charts, uh, and that's because, obviously, we don't want ships to run aground. Now, uh, unbeknownst to everybody in the scientific world is that they actually had a relatively high-resolution data set within their archives that nobody knew about. That was, what was collected with older data, what we call single beam, which is just a single sound wave sent down to the seabed, and it comes back up, and you measure this, you know what the speed of sound in water is, so you measure the time, and um, you can then measure the depth. We, they, were very, they, 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 want, they were a bit worried about our new techniques, because they thought it would put them all out of jobs, basically. Um, because they spent many months at sea collecting data with the traditional techniques. What they didn't realize was that with the high resolution techniques, you don't have to be at sea for very long, but it takes you many months to actually process the data. So nobody was going it was just gonna be a, a different sort of job basically. So what we did was we, they gave us their original data and we processed it into a form that we can actually look at it. So what, when they, what they do is they actually have numbers on their charts with just the depth points, but that doesn't show you the landscape. And so you have to interpolate the surfaces between those data points. So that's basically interpreting between, oops, between all of these different depth points that you have. Each of these crosses is a depth point. 
And so what I'm going to show you next is actually what, this, what the floor in the central part of the channel, south of Brighton, looks like. And this is it. Um, and, and it's just beautiful. What you can see here, what you're looking at in these colours is depth, the colour-coded depth, basically. So the yellows are about minus 30 metres water depth. You can see the Isle of Wight here, that's about 45 kilometres across. Um, and the yellows are uh, 30 metres water depth, the greens are about 40 metres, and then the blues are getting down into minus 60, minus 70. And then down here, we're getting down into about minus 90 metres water depth. Obviously, you can't see these shapes when you've just got depth measurements on a chart over here. And so actually, the UK Hydrographic Office surveyors were astonished when they saw this chart. They said, oh, we had no idea it looked like this, because there's actually a pattern in this. So firstly, mostly what you can see is most of the shelf, and this is all bedrock, this is just rock on the floor, is, is, is shallow, relatively shallow and flat. But then running through the centre of the strait, and so I guess Brighton is, this is the Paleo Aran, Brighton is somewhere up here, uh, Southampton is over here. Uh, running through the centre of the channel, we've got this long elongate feature, which is basically a large valley that's been carved into the rock. You can see another valley in here, running through here. This is actually, sh it, you can see it's not that deep, that's actually because it's filled with sediment. But it's actually another valley, and this is actually the trace of a river that does not exist anymore, but would have been England's largest river, the River Solent, but it became extinct. Um, I don't know when, probably um, several hundred thousand years ago. Um, but it actually, it came through here around the Isle of Wight and down and down through here and down and then joined what we, and this is called the Northern Paleo Valley. And it's been known about for some time from the low resolution data, but this was the first data that showed it in high resolution and enabled us to start exploring the mechanisms. I make it sound easy, it wasn't easy. We had this data for actually quite a long time and had no idea what this meant, and I'll come to that shortly. Uh, but what you can see is that we've got this large valley. Oop, here's another view of this close up. You can see the Paleo Solent over here. We've got this large valley running through the centre of the channel. Um, we've got terraces at the margins of this valley over here, and this is about 40 metres deep, cut into bedrock. So between here and the deepest part, it's 40 metres deep. And within the valley, you've got large scour systems over here. It's very unusual. You don't see, and it's about 10 kilometers across. That's very unusual. Onshore rivers don't look like this. They tend to be single thread and they tend to be meandering. And this is a large valley. And then you've got these island-like features, which are very important, um, which have this lozenge shape uh, in the center of the valleys. Here's another view of this, uh, closer up with different color shading. Um, these black holes, black, black uh, circles, are actually where the British Geological Survey have actually cored the rock so they know what the geology is. And we know that all of the rock here is actually chalk. But now you can see even more detail here in this close-up. You can see these island-like features over here, beautifully here. And then you've got this lovely terrace that's carved into the edge of the valley. And look how smooth the sides of the valleys are over here. And then we've got these little drainage patterns superimposed, but much smaller. And then on the floor, and I'm going to show you high resolution data in a bit, oh, you've got these linear features, these sort of erosional scours formed on the base of this thing. Nobody had seen anything like this before. This was entirely new. And actually, even the scientists, we had no idea what this meant. This was completely outside my realm of experience. And actually, science, uh, sometimes I think people outside science think that you know, we kind of understand it all. No, actually, most of the time I spend scratching my head wondering, what, what does this mean? OK, so I'm going to take you to the Western US. How do we explain this? Well, what actually happened was, um, I'll come to the story of what actually happened. There is actually a landscape from, similar to this in the Western US. It's actually a very famous story in the Western US, and every geologist, it's very publicly known, but we don't really know about this in Europe. This is a very famous American geologist called J. Harlan Bretz, who in the 1920s and 30s mapped an area of really weird landscapes in, uh, in Oregon State, in, in Washington State, in eastern Washington State, that's called the Channeled Scabland. It's very, very bizarre terrain, uh, beautiful to go to. And he posited um, in the 1920s 
that this landscape, bizarre landscape uh, had been carved by large-scale floods. Um, and he had a similar, even worse reaction than actually Smith. Um, well, Smith was just ignored, whereas J. Harlan Bretz was actually vehemently opposed in public by scientists for completely crazy ideas, which actually held back the science for about 40 years. So his views were completely repressed by leading scientists of the time. And it wasn't until the 1960s, when he was 90, that they were actually firmly accepted. It took a long time uh, um, there. So this is the place called the Channel Scabland over here, which comprises these really large valleys that have been carved into really hard rock basalt, volcanic rocks. And when you go there, you see landscapes like this. So you see these completely dry valleys. These are actually huge valleys, much larger than what we see in the English Channel. Um, these are about 100 meters deep, carved into uh, bedrock. These are all volcanic flows over here. Um, but the trouble is, you can see there's no rivers flowing through here. So normally you'd regard a, a valley as being carved by rivers, but there's no rivers at all. And um, um, Brett said, well, how do we explain this landscape without rivers? And people said, oh, the rivers died out, but there's no evidence for rivers. Um, other people said these were carved by glaciers, but we now know that the glaciers didn't actually advance this far. And what we find is that the surfaces over here are actually strewn with giant boulders, but boulders the size of this room. So just imagine that. There are boulders the size of this room lying on the surface. Normal rivers can't move boulders like that, so people said those were glaciers, but we now know that that's completely wrong. So it requires tremendous forces to move those. And then what we see, which struck me immediately, was we see these island-like shapes over here. Do you see these Lossin shapes? That are very, very similar to what we see in um, the English Channel. And they have a specific ge geological term or geomorphological term. They're called streamlined islands. And they're actually produced when you have really high velocity, high discharge flows, is that the local bedrock basically gets um, carved into these streamlined shapes by really high forces. And people have done experiments on these things, etc., which I won't go into. Um, if you look at, if you think about it, if, you know, cyclists wear these really beautiful streamlined helmets. They are drag re uh, re reducing features. So these are essentially reducing drag, essentially. Uh, uh, they form this perfect shape over here. And these are ubiquitous in the channel Scabland. And you can see this here. This is an aerial view. You can see how this is basalt over here. And this, you can see how the islands have carved this beautiful feature by these huge floods. And we don't get these scalar features in normal rivers. So we can discount normal rivers as being the mechanism to form these. OK, so how do we reach this? I actually knew nothing about this landscape. It's not something we're taught in Britain, except every North American knows about this, because it's such a famous geological story. Well, when we were pondering the landscape in the, under the sea and looking at our maps and wondering how, how do we explain this. I actually happened to be in the library one day and I was flicking through a journal looking for something else and I came across this image. This is actually one of our own images, but this was a, there was a black and white image. These are landscapes on Mars. And what you can see is, this is something I knew nothing about, I knew nothing about Mars, um, but I saw this image and this thing and I thought, oh my God, this is exactly what we're seeing in this English channel. And this led to this in incredible paper chase. I, I can't tell you the excitement. I saw this image and I rushed to tell my friend, my colleague Jenny, he said, look, 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 look at this. And then we just started, we abandoned everything else for about a year. We just stopped doing everything else. I have at least three papers that have never been completed since that time, because this was more important. And we just read everything we could, and we read back into all the old literature on floods, etc. Because these, are, these were interpreted after the Viking missions to Mars. People had seen these in the orbital data by analogy with the channeled Scabland as huge floods on Mars. Um, and these are our streamlined islands on Mars formed by very, very similar processes. Um, and that's what led me into working on Mars. And as Nick said, that I mostly work on Mars these days. By, so actually, I can thank the English Channel for a complete career change. I mean, I mean complete, full 360, 180, whatever you like to call it, career change that I could never have imagined just because of what we discovered in the English Channel. Um, so 
you can see going back to this, we have our streamlined islands over here. And um, we interpreted this data as evidence for enhan enhancement of Smith's idea of huge floods, mega floods, that came about because at the peak of the glaciations, and we call it, the, the, it's really the Anglian glaciation, which occurred about 450,000 years ago. That was the furthest advance of the Scandinavian and British ice sheets. That was the biggest glaciation. Um, so not the last glaciation, more than 450,000 years ago, when um, basically the ice margin ran from Norfolk all the way to Denmark. That would be in the edge of the ice sheets. And in the southern North Sea, there would have been a giant lake. And at some point, this lake, we posited, we said, hypothesized that this lake overspilled and breached the, the rock ridge at the Dover Straits to produce these flood landforms. So our paper was published, the initial paper was published in 1997 and immediately was extremely controversial. In fact, it was published in Nature, which is one of the leading science journals, but Nature tends to publish things that are quite controversial. So I don't think it was published because of the science. It was actually published because they wanted the controversy. Uh, because they're interested in the subject moving forward. So it was immediately, in the US it was firmly accepted because of the Smith, uh, because of the channeled scab land. But in Europe, people were really unhappy. I've had people stand up at conferences and say, and say this is completely wrong. You, know, you cannot, this, this cannot be, this is impossible. Um, and, you know, I will admit the data is not completely foolproof because it was low resolution. We gridded it at 25 meters uh, per pixel, so, and, and actually I was at a conference um, two years ago, I was at a conference in Utrecht where I knew a lot of the audience had originally been quite opposed to our ideas, uh, partly also that Jenny and I had stepped into a new area that was occupied by other people and you should never do that, we were interlopers. Um, and people said, you know, uh, so I, I kind of, played my talk in an interesting way because I knew there were people who didn't believe me. So my title slide was Some Fairy Tales from the English Channel. Um, and, I, and I said, as you all know, uh, all fairy tales have an element of truth to them. Um, but um, I said that actually to absolutely prove this, we're going to have to collect uh, new data from here with high resolution sonars, but that's going to cost about one million to two million pounds and nobody's gonna do it. So it's probably not gonna happen in my lifetime. As I was leaving my talk to go and get a coffee, somebody tapped me on my shoulder and said, uh, Sanjeev, we've actually just collected the data. And unbeknownst to us, actually, uh, CFAS and uh, English Nature had actually, uh, the Marine Conservancy had actually collected the data for um, marine, marine conservation. So here is the, Oh, I'm going to show you that later, actually, that data. It comes up. Okay, after our initial paper, we set about mapping the entire channel with any data we could get hold of ourselves, which was quite difficult. And you can see, at that stage, the French had very little data over here. They were quite embarrassed by that. They've subsequently collected the data. But you can see this was the area we had data for. And you can see the channel valley actually extends into the Dover Straits. Over here, we lose it because it's actually filled with sediment. If we go to Calais, to Dover, you can see here's this prominent valley running through the center of the channel of the Dover Straits, and this is called the Lowberg Valley over here. So we've got Dover over here, Folkestone down here, and Calais, and you can see this really prominent valley running through the center and then connects up to that channel over here. So our idea was that basically, and this is the chalk ridge over here, so this is the escarpment that stretches across the North Downs, all the way across to Calais. And obviously this will be the feature of our wonderful new geopark, the UNESCO geopark, including the submarine areas. Um, and what we wanted to do was to survey in this area. In fact, that was my idea. And Jenny said, who's a marine geophysicist, said, uh, no, I'm not doing it. This is the world's busiest shipping lane and also has some of the highest tides in the world. The tides run like this, and to do surveys, you need to be going like this, parallel to the uh, ferries that are going this way and that way, and the container ships that are going this way and that way. It's a complete nightmare. So she said no, and anyway, we didn't get funded, so that was thing. Um, but we were looking, for, looking to see what was published, and I actually found this um, um, French thesis online, wonderful Google. I found this French thesis 
that had collected some, some data from this area in the, in the early 2000s. But the, date, the interpretation was wrong, but I managed to track down who the supervisor of the student was, and I phoned him up. And what they'd done is not just bathymetry data, they'd actually collected subsurface data. That's data that's from going beneath the rock layers. And they showed some really interesting features. So I phoned this person up, Alain um, Tontesor, who's at the University of Lille, uh, who's subsequently been involved in our work, and he said, hmm, Alain is quite vague at times. He said, hmm, let me see, that was a long time ago. I will go and look in my lab. About three hours later, he phones me up and said, oh, I found some of the data lying in a corner in a cupboard. Um, it looks quite interesting, he said. So we actually took the next train, the ch channel tunnel over the following day, and the data was just remarkable, but it was paper data. And then in six months' time, he actually found the data drive that he actually had the electronic data stored on, which was remarkable. So I'm gonna show you data. So what they've done is they collected data at the black lines as part of a master's project in the Straits. You know, it's just remarkable how they did that because um, it's, it's so difficult to survey. And then subsequently, we worked with some Belgian colleagues who collected more additional data the additional data was actually collected for a rather bizarre reason, not for um, our work. Um, so that data was actually collected following the big Japanese tsunami. You remember the huge Japanese tsunami, which affected the nuclear power station. Uh, the, uh, what is it, Fukushima power station? Fushima power station. Um, because of that earthquake and the tsunami. Well, France and um, Belgium have a number of nuclear power stations on their north coast. And the channel actually has a number of faults. They're not active at the present day, but they are seismically active. And the last earthquake was in the 1500s, which actually uh, a, a, a church steeple fell down in London as a result of that earthquake. And you get very, very small earthquakes in the channel. So they really the nuclear companies really panicked about something like that happened. And so they funded a whole series of surveys looking at the faults in the, in, in the channel Etc. to mapping those out. And then we were lucky because of our collaboration to actually get access to that data. So what these are, are what you were looking at previously, the colored maps were basically maps to the depth of the seabed, basically from the, uh, from the um, sea surface, showing you how deep the water was and the structure of, so you can see there's topography here. What this is showing you is um, we're sending a sound wave, sound waves uh, into the earth and it's called se seismic waves basically, works similar to earthquakes and they basically measure the time the sound wave goes down into the rock layers and then it bounces, the, bounces off the rock layers. So you build up a st structure of the subsurface basically. And what we can see here, and actually these had been shown before in terms of the channel tunnel service. So when they did the first surveys for the channel tunnel, they discovered basically giant holes in the bedrock, in the rock of the, cha of the, of the channel that were filled with sediment, so soft sediment. In fact, the first routeway of the channel tunnel was gonna go straight through one of these holes. So you can see this hole here that's cut through the chalk into the gold clay and it's filled with very, very soft sediment the tunnel was actually gonna go straight through this. And obviously that would have been a disaster because water would have seeped and it would have collapsed, etc. So they actually had to change the channel tunnel routeway. You can actually see the channel tunnel here. That's the see, do you see these little diffractions, these little up pointing things? That's the channel tunnel. What's happening is the sound waves are actually bouncing off the channel tunnel, you can see those. What this shows us is the structure and all of this is rock. Over here, this is rock, this is rock. These are giant holes that have been carved into the, the rock that have then subsequently got filled in with sediment. Now, and you can see the detail over here, and there's the tunnel over here really nicely over here. So the French study that I talked about had actually interpreted these as valleys, river valleys, but the problem was that these were river valleys that were going between Dover and Calais, and that made no sense whatsoever. There's no way that rivers would flow, and there were no rivers that flowed that way. It just doesn't make any geological sense. Um, we then took this data and compiled it into 3D representations. So what you can see here is three of these lines. Three, these are different lines. Let me just go back. So these are 
three lines over here displaced next to each other. And you can see the structure really nicely. So you see how the shape of these holes changes as you go sideways. They actually lose the, the hole this way. Look at this one over here. This, you've got a hole over here. This is vertically exaggerated. It's not that steep. But uh, this is about 500 meters across and about 60 meters deep. So it, it, it's quite extreme vertical exaggeration, uh, just to show you. Um, but you can see how this hole over here, you don't see it uh, a few kilometers uh, sideways, and you don't see it a few kilometers sideways that way. So if this was a valley going between Dover and Calais, it makes no sense. Here's another view. There's the interpretation. And you can see they've got a number of these holes over here. And then here's another view. You can see some more of these beautiful holes with some internal rock layering, really, really nice rock layering in here. And this is the bedrock. That's the hard rock, and this is the soft rock. And you can see, look at this lovely hole in here. And the question was, what formed these if these were not river valleys? The other thing we can do is, again, this is, again, the three-dimensional shape of these. You can see they have strong three-dimensionality. And what we show is that they're not actually elongate features, but they're circular features cut into the rock, which is quite strange. What we did then was we actually took the thickness of the rock layers, of the layers within the valleys, and just made a thickness map. How thick is the sediment? Um, and we have a special term for this. But what you can see is this just tells you where those holes exist. And we don't have continuous data because it's very hard to collect this data. It's, I mean, I can tell you, basically, my, my colleagues who were doing the newer surveys, they said it was extremely difficult to keep the ship's captain out at sea. He was so terrified of the container ships that they would basically try and do it as fast as possible and say, I'm going back now. And they would have to say, no, no, we've paid you to just do the surveys. These container ships are enormous. And so um, it's really difficult. So, you know, shout out to this team in uh, the University of Ghent for actually doing this work. Um, so you can see here these holes, these deeps, we call them, that are filled with sediment. But they don't occur everywhere. If this was a valley, they would be continuous across. What's also very interesting is we don't see these holes anywhere else in the channel, not that deep. We don't see them upstream of the uh, straits, and we don't see them downstream of the straits. They're focused over here. And as you can see, there's a con connection here, because we know that the ridge line runs along here. And the chalk actually runs along here, through here. So how do we explain this? So this is just another map, just showing you the chalk. The green is the chalk. Almost done. So you can see the valley here running down here. And these, the, these are the, the red ones are the holes. And you can see this is the North Downs over here. The Rock Ridge would have extended all the way across to France. And you can see, basically, these holes occur at the foot of the escarpment of the chalk. They're completely localized there. And they don't occur anywhere else. We've not found them anywhere else. So our interpretation of this, there's another view of these holes. And our interpretation is that these are giant plunge pools. So what we think happened was that this is a cross-section across the escarpment. So this is the North Downs escarpment, basically. And this is to the northeast, and this is to the southwest. And the lake would have extended all the way to the crest of the escarpment over here. But to the south of the escarpment, there's a vertical face. And we believe that what happened was that water overspilled and created a giant waterfall at the, it's not Niagara Falls, it's much broader, but it's a waterfall nevertheless. And th this is an experiment, uh, not done by us, this is actually done by uh, engineers, civil engineers, who are looking at dam breaches. They look at how dams collapse, and they look at what, what are the consequences are for downstream. What happens when you do a dam breach is that you essentially you get a hose of water and sediment piling into the rock downstream of the dam, and it produces a giant hole, or a plunge pool. So this is only a few you know, tens of centimeters across. So we believe that these um, 
holes, essentially, are huge plunge pools. But these are the largest plunge pools on Earth. You see plunge pools elsewhere, but they're produced by very steep but narrow waterfalls. This is a very broad range of waterfalls across the entire strait. And um, these are up to 90 meters deep, up to 100 meters deep, but hundreds of meters wide. And so this requires huge sustained water flows to produce these things. So um, when we published this paper in 2017, um, so there's a story behind this beautiful graphic. I was very uncertain about this graphic. So when we were, um, our university, our press officer wanted to do a press release on this story. Uh, we'd had, for the first paper, we hadn't had an amazing press coverage. It was completely, I was totally unprepared for it. So was our press officer because he'd been in his job for two days and it was one of the biggest stories Imperial had ever had. Um, um, but he was still the press officer for this, so this time we were prepared. And he phoned me up one day just before the publication and um, he said, um, Sanji, firstly, I just want to discuss something with you, but we'd, we'd like you to sit down first. Uh, so I sat down. He said, um, um, we'd like to do a graphic, and I found an artist. And I'm going to sh show you some examples of his work. Um, uh, but just bear with me, he said. So he showed me these pictures. And he'd actually found this fantasy artist who had pictures of knights and pterodactyls <laughs> and dragons. It was fabulous. But this artist who lives in New York actually produced this actually within a week. This is all done digitally on an iPad in one week with continuous talk between a whole number of scientists trying to get the science right. It's not completely right, I would say. I think the, the, it's too steep. I don't think that's accurate. Um, but you know, you have to, you, it's a bit of artistic license, if you like, to convey this. Um, this was hugely successful. It's just sort of become a meme for this topic, and that's perfectly OK um, um, over there. Just to convey that sense of this ice lake that existed in the North Sea and this dramatic uh, feature, maybe not as steep as this, but would have been pretty dramatic landscape. And then this dry land, this would have occurred when the sea didn't exist. Uh, at a peak of the glaciations, this dry land that was suddenly carved by the complete breaching of this. So this is just, just the moments, if you like. It's fossilized landscape picture just before the breach, basically. And you know, once one of the breaches start going, the whole edifice would have collapsed. And there would have been people living, likely, in the channel. And it would have been extraordinary to, well, you wouldn't have wanted to be there, frankly. <laughs> anyway. Um, so the work has been taken up by artists, actually. I know there's some artists involved with this, but I, I just wanted to introduce you to this work by a Dutch artist called Leonard Lohi, who a few years ago... So what was interesting about our paper was our paper actually was published a week after Article 50 was enacted. So we were a little bit naughty, and we, 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 the tagline for our paper was Brexit 1-0. And this artist got really interested in this, so he, he actually took our painting, printed it, or that picture, and printed it on this uh, uh, paper, and then burnt it as a, as a representation of Brexit, if you like. An interesting uh, sort of metaphor, if you like. And this was then displayed in a gallery in Holland a couple of years ago. Uh, so there's also features, I'm going to stop it very shortly, there's also some amazing features actually on the floor that you can see, just this beautiful landscapes that you could see. But we also see some remarkable waterfalls, or paleo waterfalls, fossil waterfalls, preserved on the floor of the channel in the present day landscape. And you can see these features over here. This wall here is 20 meters high, and we've got a plunge pool in here, and a scour in here. And these are actually later floods. So we had the big flood that made the complete breach and created those giant holes that were filled with sediment. But then we had subsequent floods, maybe from some smaller lakes during subsequent glaciations, that actually then continued to erode the channel floor. And we can see these features here now. And this is an example of a, this is a giant cataract in the, in the channel scabland that you can see here. This is 100 meters high, so this is significantly bigger than something like this. But you can see the form of this and the shape of the landscape. And then we see erosional features. These are some really bizarre features that we don't quite understand yet. And um, this figure 
Right, I haven't coming not coming out on the screen, but this is the pig figure that nails this. I'll have to show it to you on a computer if anybody's interested. This is the new high resolution data that I said was collected uh, uh, a couple of years ago for uh, nature for, for for designating marine protected areas. And this absolutely nails it, that this was a flood landscape, because what we see is we see these beautiful grooves, these erosional grooves carved into the floor. This is one meter resolution data. So each object that you can see on there is one meter resolution. And um, there's no way that rivers can produce these sorts of things. It requires high magnitude flows. So that, that we, we basically, I think the question for that, and all, the, all our opponents have kind of now swung back to actually believing us, which is nice. It's happened in my lifetime, which is quite nice, unlike <laughs> haven't had to wait 40 years like Brett's. And this is what the lake would have looked like. There's the, um, there's the ice margin over here. And it's possible that there were lakes in Germany that then also overspilled to produce this. And what this event would have caused is that the Rhine would have switched course and then drained through the English Channel, forming what we call the Great Channel River and would have been an almighty scene to observe. So I'm going to leave you here with a little quote from Shakespeare. It is remarkable to think of Britain as an island, as a fortress built by nature for herself. Quite remarkable to think about that. Thank you very much. so much, Sanjeev. Um, we're now going to have a, a moment to have some, some questions um, and then we can extend the conversation a bit. And a, a great friend and colleague of mine, <laughs> Melanie Wrigley, who's a local expert, um, many of you will know, will join Sanjeev. Uh, and and we, we can ask, I think Mel, perhaps you've got a couple of questions to start with. And then if anyone else has any other questions for Sanjeev, um, I know he will be only too happy to take them. Thank you for that brilliant talk. It was just so fantastic. And to hear it from you, and you've collected the data and brought it together. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I wanted to ask you, you, you hinted about it with the data collected from the French and Belgians about the uh, seismic activity in the channel. D do you think it may have been an earthquake on one of those fault lines that may have breached the land bridge? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a question we often get asked is what actually caused the initial breach that allowed the water to plunge through. And there's many different mechanisms. So an earthquake is highly likely um, because we have active faults, not hugely active, there's nothing for, to worry about. They're not like the San Andreas fault, etc. cetera. Um, I can understand the concern of the, um, of geologists just to understand where the faults were because they weren't properly mapped. Um, but I think it's something that we'll never be able to prove whether it was an earthquake. It, it could also have been that the lake waters just rose because as the glaciers started melting, as the ice sheets started melting and retreating, the water would have risen in the lake and it would have just maybe overtopped that barrier. So these things can just, yeah, it's just these things can just happen basically just due to normal force. So it's something that geologists talk about um, is do you need external forces to cause something or can internal forces, forces within the system can cause these and that could be just the internal system. Thank you. I'd also like to ask you, when, when we consider the mega floods in the Dover Strait, would we be correcting thinking that they're some of the largest mega floods that have happened on Earth or certainly in Europe? Yes, I think they would have been some of the largest. Uh, it's, it, what, what scientists do is they can use the dimensions of the landform features to actually say something about the size of the floods. Um, but it's quite hard, actually. So people did this with the Channel Scab Land, um, and th they had incredible numbers. And actually, more recently, people have questioned that, the methods, etc. So it's just a very difficult arc. It's something that we call paleohydrology, so going back into the past, and I always say paleohydrology is a dark art because it's just completely untestable. You can create numbers, um, but you, you can't test that. And you often get asked, so what was the size of the flood, etc.? Um, 
and we don't know. What we can do is that there are some floods that we know quite well. So there's one flood in particular, and again in the western US, it's called the Bonneville flood. And this was a one-time event. If, if any of you have been to Salt Lake City in Utah, there's a huge salt lake. And this was during, uh, again, during glacial periods or um, around 15,000 years ago, this would have been a huge lake. And around 15,000 years ago, this great salt lake, Bonneville, lake, lake Bonneville it's called, actually, again, overspilled a rock barrier in a one-time event. And because it's a much younger flood event, that was 15,000 years ago, whereas our flood was 450,000 years ago, and it's also on land, um, people can measure the dimensions of the channel that was produced by the flood very accurately, so they can measure, I think they can get, get guesstimate the flood discharges, but we also know what the volume of water was in the lake because the lake shorelines are really well mapped. And actually using those, those sorts of information, you can actually calculate how long it took. So they estimate that Lake Bonneville actually drained in a flood event that lasted several months. So, you know, initial high peak and then slowly draining. So I imagine something like that for, uh, obviously the English Channel Lake, the North Sea Lake would have been much larger, um, but something like that over several months to drain. I'm not sure that I think it's working. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Anyone burning to ask? We've got one there. And Yeah, I'm not sure about that relationship. I think that's re related to sort of later geomorphic, geomorphic development. I think what's interesting is the the Pebble Beach at Dungeness is very interesting because obviously it's made out of flint and a big and that's, that's quite an unusual feature. You don't really see these things over the world, and so it is my conjecture, and this is entirely conjecture, is that I wonder if the flints were actually derived from the material the breached material actually, and that got then reworked by wave processes into that. It's such, such a remarkable feature, and that rock must have gone somewhere. So chalk would have sort of dissolved and disintegrated, but the flints would have been there, and I wonder if the flints had been derived from that breach. And, and could other people hear the question, or do we need to oh, repeat yeah, sorry. it? I will repeat it next time. Yeah, okay. So the qu question here, thank you. Oh yeah, that's another difficult question. That's a really good question. Um, I think quite a lot has been eroded by lateral retreat of the sea cliffs. Um, it's something I've meant to look into. So I've got colleagues at Imperial College who've actually been, they use a very interesting technique called cosmogenic isotope dating, where it basically, what it can do is it can, um, you look at the last time the rock was exposed to sunlight basically, which carries cosmic rays and can change, cause changes in the minerals and, and, and rocks, etc., in a simple way. So they can, it's, it's a form of surface exposure dating. It dates when a rock was exposed. And what they've been using this technique for is to measure long-term rates of cliff retreat. And it's something I haven't done, but I've been meaning to go to their data because they have some of the first data on this. And there's been some French workers doing something similar on the side and see if we can back calculate um, that, but that's that's a really important question. What you could do is actually you could look at the extent of the deeps, the, the what we call the Fostangar, those giant holes, and say that as the minimum extent of the breach, and then that we would have subsequently got the retreat that way. Okay, we've got another question up there. Um, so, um, so firstly, we're not absolutely sure there were people there. That's a conjecture again. I think it's like, um, it could, because it would have been quite cold. So what's interesting is that the archaeologists have been very, very interested in our work. Because um, in parallel, there was a really big project going on led by people from the Natural History Museum and the British Museum in documenting the early human occupation of Britain. Um, uh, led by Professor Chris Stringer, who's at the Natural History Museum. 
Britain has a, southern Britain has a very rich record of lithics, so stone tools, that indicate that early uh, southern England was occupied by early humans during the warm stages. So certainly um, there were multiple episodes of occupation. The low-lying areas in the channel would actually have been quite a nice pre-breaching and during, uh, during, you know, this, it's this period, it's not completely cold and not completely warm, so when it's still a landmass before the sea floods in, um, would have been quite a nice area. You know, there would have been small rivers, there would have been floodplains, would have been a good place to live. The lake would have formed at the peak of the glaciations, so it's likely that people may still have been occupying these areas during these cold stages. What's very interesting, this is what's got archaeologists really interested, is that we see an early, rich record of early humans, and then around about 180,000 years ago to uh, about 60,000 years ago, we have no current evidence of early humans living in Britain. So that means that people look at the rocks or the sediments from that time, and they haven't found stone tools in those. That's not that, that might just be a sampling bias in that we haven't found stone tools, but there is this gap. And the idea there is that maybe because of the breach and the change in the landscape, people were no, no longer able to cross the land bridge. And also there would have been a huge river occupying the central channel. It would have been very difficult to cross. So maybe early humans, Neanderthals, would not have been able to cross into southern England uh, so there's, there's the, uh, we're in an interglacial at the moment, and the prior interglacial, what we call the interglacial 5E, there's absolutely, even though wet temperatures were actually much warmer than the present interglacial in, in Britain, there's no evidence for early humans, so which seems remarkable. So um, either we haven't found the evidence or that basically the change in the landscape basically prevented people um, migrating. Thank you. And I think I don't want to keep you longer than we promised. So one more question. There was a question here. There. Oh, no, sorry. OK, we'll go with you. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, not exactly, but there's a relationship, obviously. So Doggerland's this area. So this qu question was, you know, how does this tie in with Doggerland? Um, and so Doggerland is really related to the last sea level rise. So after the last glacial maximum, sea level progressively rose to our present day sea level. Um, because we no longer had this land bridge, the sea would have actually flooded through the Straits of Dover, and the lowest lying area would have been in the Southern North Sea, in the northern part of the Southern North Sea, which is this area called Doggerland. That was a term that was co coined by an archeologist called Bryony Coles, um, uh, that has been extensively studied. And this was this relatively high lying area, and it's likely that again, early humans occupied that area, but that's a much younger story than our story. Okay, I think we'll, we'll stop it there, but Sanjeev is a very generous man, so if you do have other questions, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> do come and say do hello to Sanjeev. So, um, what a what an absolutely extraordinary story, and so beautifully told. Plenty of humor, I like that, Sanjeev. So, could we uh, thank Sanjeev, uh, Professor Sanjeev Gupta once more uh, for joining us after just coming back from a conference, flying in yesterday and coming straight down here to speak to us. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. There's still a little bit more of the Salt Plus Earth Festival. There's a, um, a, a wrap event, a wrap up event on the Mermaid Beach. So there's still programs. Do join in the last bit of the festival. Um, and thank you all very much for coming. If you enjoyed this and you want to get more involved and want to hear more about the Geopark, then do get in touch with us through the Kent Downs, through Folks and Fringe or Creative Folkestone, because we'd love to continue the conversation. Thank you all.